need to be part of a community, a fellowship where we reach out to others together. You won't do that in isolation. For the summer months, Living Truth has compiled a number of highly requested messages taken from several inspiring series. You call me out upon the water, the great unknown, where feet may fail. This is Living Truth. We continue presenting our Living Truth Summer Series. For the summer months, Living Truth has compiled a number of highly requested messages taken from several inspiring series. Although times change, clear biblical teaching addresses the issues of the day, past, present, and future. This is Living Truth. Let me read to you from John chapter 20, an event that took place after the resurrection, in fact, on the evening of the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. John 20, verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now down to verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's as far as we're going to read. This event forever defines Thomas in our mind. We talk about him as doubting Thomas. We say of somebody who doubts, oh, you're a doubting Thomas. It's not altogether fair that we do that. This is one event in Thomas's life, and he wasn't the only one who doubted either. You see, doubt is not uncommon. It's very likely that in this building, there are people who say, well, you know, Yes, I'm here because I'm interested, but you know, I have some very, very serious doubts. Many of us identify with the prayer of that man who said to Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because yes, there's a margin to which I'm willing to say, yes, I believe, but there's a big margin beyond that that I, I, I don't know if I can believe I have my doubt. You don't have to have everything all worked out, but there's an important process I want to talk to you about this morning from this event in Thomas's life. Because dealing with doubt can be difficult, but doubt is not always an enemy. Doubt is sometimes a friend. Because often it is the process of doubt, if we are conscientious about this and we are honest about our doubts, it is through them that we arrive at conviction. In Jude, which has only one chapter, the book of Jude, verse 22, it says, be merciful to those who doubt. Be encouraging, be merciful to them. Now, let me put this event into its context. The setting is the evening of the day of Jesus' resurrection. You remember that Jesus on Friday had died, he'd been buried, and his disciples had gone into hiding. 
They spent Saturday in hiding behind locked doors. No doubt they were considering what their options were. What should they do next, if anything? Because the dream had died. Jesus was dead, although he told them they had not expected it. They probably discussed their options. Should we pack up and go home to Galilee? We'd be mistaken, we'd be misled. We expected this would be the Messiah who would liberate Israel. But now, he's dead. It's all just an idle dream. That was probably the nature of their discussion on the Saturday. On Sunday morning, they began to hear rumors that the tomb was empty. It tells us that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and others with them came to the apostles, we're told in Luke's gospel, and told them the tomb was empty. Mary Magdalene had gone back alone, met whom she presumed to be the gardener, and said, where have you laid the body? Because the body's been removed. And he turned around, looked in the face and said, Mary. And she knew that it was Jesus. But the disciples hadn't believed that. Luke 24, 11 says they're not impressed. They did not believe the women because their words seem to them like nonsense. The King James says their words seem to them as idle tales. Two of the disciples had decided to investigate for themselves. Peter and John, I'm intrigued, only two. The others didn't even bother investigating, and they ran to the tomb, and they found it was empty, but there was no evidence he'd risen. And it says in John 20 and verse 9, that after Peter and John had seen the empty tomb and believed what Mary had told them, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They didn't believe. And so they're working through all the options. Maybe somebody's removed the body. Maybe the Roman authorities. Maybe some grave robbers have stolen the body. Maybe the women who claim to have seen Jesus were hallucinating. And by evening, they still did not know when suddenly... In the room where they were, behind locked doors, for fear that maybe the sun he didn't cancel who'd orchestrated the death of Jesus would now come for them, Jesus suddenly appeared in the room without the courtesy of coming through the door. He just appeared. Now in his resurrection body, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples, it says, were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. The only problem was that Thomas wasn't there, and Thomas eventually arrived Verse 25 says, the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. And I want to talk about three things from this event here. I want to talk first about the cause of his doubt. What caused Thomas to doubt like this? I think when we look at the story itself, we can deduce four reasons, at least I'm going to suggest you four possible reasons why Thomas doubted. One of these may have been the primary reason. It may have been a combination of all four. I'm going to give you four words that can lead you to doubt. The first word is the word isolation. By that I mean Thomas was not with the disciples when Jesus came and stood amongst them. He was not within the fellowship, within the community of the disciples when they met with Jesus. And I think that is significant. You may think I'm pushing a point here, but I don't think I am. Standing alone apart from other believers, standing in isolation as a Christian, not being actively involved in the community of fellow Christians is going to leave us vulnerable to doubt. Again and again, God meets with us in community as believers. He works amongst us communally. Now, it is true that a person comes to Christ individually. We come alone to Christ in repentance of our sin, and we place our faith in Christ. But at that moment, as Scripture teaches us, we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And in that body, we become part of a new community where we are interdependent upon one another, and we cannot and we must not seek to live in isolation from that community as believers. That is why we have the church. Now, I'm forever hearing people say, well, I can be a Christian without being part of the church. 
And there is a technical sense in which that is true. But you'll never thrive as a Christian outside of the community of believers. The letter to the Ephesians is all about that, and it's implicit and explicit in other letters of the New Testament. The letter to the Ephesians tells us that there is one body to which we've been brought, and in that body we have different gifts, different functions. First Corinthians talks a lot about that. We are interdependent upon one another. We cannot survive in isolation from one another. And I know Christian people who are not regular in their attendance in congregations of the people of God, and it is always, I would suggest to you, from observation, always detrimental to their faith. I know some Christians who go here one week and go somewhere another week and hang at home for another week and say, ah, oh, we watch TV and get some service off TV, and then we go to another church another week, and they don't really belong, and then they get into some kind of difficulty, and, and they don't know how to cope because they're not part of the fellowship that we're intended to be part of. I even doubt whether meeting just for an hour on Sunday morning is sufficient. We need to be part of a community, a fellowship where together we, we meet with God together, we study the scriptures together, we pray together, we reach out to others together. You won't do that in isolation. And so the first possible reason why Thomas doubts is he is in isolation the second part is his stubbornness. That may be the reason, just sheer stubbornness. Notice this, verse 25, he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Notice that. He doesn't say, I cannot believe it, but I will not believe it. In other words, my problem is not an intellectual problem. I can't believe this. It's actually a volitional problem. I will not believe it. And for many people, it's not actually the intellectual issues that are the problem. It's their will. It's their volition. You can make up your mind not to believe. You can find a million reasons not to believe because you actually don't want to believe. Sometimes our reasons for not believing are not intellectual, though we put up that smoke screen, but they're actually volitional, and they're volitional because they are psychological, and it could be because we are sheer pride. Stops us believing. Well, these are the causes of his doubt. Second thing I want to talk about is the conditions or possible causes. But let me talk about the conditions for his doubt. In other words, he sets up some conditions that will remove the doubt. So these are the conditions of his doubt. And that's in verse 25 again. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. He wants physical proof. Now, that is reasonable, because after all, that's what the other ten disciples had had in his absence. And it's reasonable anyway. A lot of the New Testament refers back to this physical evidence that is available. When John wrote his first letter, he wrote in 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have handled, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. John says, what I'm proclaiming to you is not a theory, it's not a philosophy. I have heard, seen, looked at, touched, and handled. That's part of his evidence that what I'm saying to you is true. So it's entirely reasonable. When Paul explains the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, and he says, this is the gospel, this is what it is. He talks about Jesus Christ, who was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scripture, that he appeared to Peter, then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 other brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to me also as the one abnormally born. So here's Paul saying, listen, this resurrection business, let me tell you the people who saw him, including 500 at one time up in Galilee. And he lists the people, including himself. And so it's legitimate to say there are concrete, historical, physical reasons. We've looked, we've seen, we've touched, we've handled 
as John has said. Now, now Thomas wants the same. It's reasonable. This is why we have what we call apologetics. Apologetics is not apologizing for anything. It's giving rational reasons for the Christian faith. But having said that, let me put into this, that legitimate as that is, let me put into this a proviso that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. Paul talks about people want certain things in order to be convinced of the gospel. He says, Jews demand miraculous signs. Give us miracles. Then we'll believe. Greeks look for wisdom. That was the Greek concern. All the great philosophers of that era came from Greece. They look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. And it's a stumbling block to the Jews who want the miracles. And it's foolishness to the Gentiles who want the wisdom. But to those whom God has called, whether they're Jews or Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Actually, if we say to God, God, if you will just do this or just do that, if you'll just heal this person, if you'll just make that happen, if you'll just give me a job, then I'll believe. Uh, 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 have you ever been tempted to come up with these conditions? You're on the wrong track. What Paul says is people look for all these things, but actually these themselves are not the things that bring you to Christ. It's actually Christ crucified. Now, I'm going to come to that in a moment because the third point, if they're the causes of Thomas's doubt and the conditions that surround his doubt, now let me talk about the collapse of his doubt. What causes his doubt to collapse? Let me point out some interesting things. Verse 26, it says, A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then, of course, you have him saying to Thomas, Look at my hands, etc. But have you ever noticed before, a week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas has had a whole week to stew in his own juice and think about all his problems and debate them with the other disciples, and he's still not convinced. A week later, where was Jesus during that week? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I find it interesting that Jesus left him a week in his doubt. Let's be careful of trying to speed people through the process of doubt and coming to conviction. Honest doubters are in a better position than unthinking believers. Because when they come to that point of conviction, they're going to hold on with, with conviction and are more likely to enjoy spiritual reality. And I'm going to, in just a moment, mention that again because I think that is Thomas' story. Because Thomas, actually, not according to the New Testament, where we don't have this information, but according to historical tradition, became the most furthest traveled apostle of all in taking the gospel to India. But before that, what was it that finally convinced Thomas when Jesus did meet with him? Well, you might say it was his resurrection, but actually that's only partially true. Notice carefully, and this is important, when Jesus appeared to Thomas, verse 27, he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Why did he show him his hands and say, touch them? And his side, put your hand into my side. Because this was the evidence of his crucifixion the evidence of his cross. What is the message of the gospel? Is it that Jesus Christ is the Messiah? As long as you know he's the Messiah, that's it. Is the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ is God and so the ultimate goal is that you worship him as God? The answer to that is no. Is it that he was a miracle worker? 
No. What is the message of the gospel? That Jesus Christ died and was raised again. And Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas, first, look at my hands. Reach out and touch. Look at my side. I find it not only interesting, I think it's crucial that what convinces Thomas is not just that Jesus had risen. If that was the only issue, then Jesus could have appeared in front of Thomas and said, Thomas, am I alive? (laughs) Yeah, you're alive, well done. That's not the gospel. Here's the gospel, Thomas, look at my hands. Touch them, my side. Put your hand there. Thomas didn't need a touch because he was convinced. You see, the reason why the resurrection of Jesus is so important is because the Jesus who is resurrected is the Jesus who had been crucified. And the gospel is the death and the resurrection of Jesus where Jesus Christ died as a substitute for sinful men and women and boys and girls to satisfy the justice of a holy God, he who had no sin, was made to be sin for us, and having died, having been crucified, the Father's satisfaction was confirmed by the fact he raised him from the dead, and therefore, Thomas, you must not separate the resurrection from the crucifixion. And he takes Thomas to the wounds in his hand. And notice he says to Thomas, you have to do something. Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. In other words, this is not just an intellectual persuasion. Do something, Thomas. Put, see, reach out, put. Do something. It's not a passive, okay, come on, prove it to me. All right, come on, convict me. Okay, come on. No, no. Thomas, get up and do something in response. And of course, he, Thomas didn't need to touch him because as Thomas responded, he knew, he knew. And he says, my Lord and my God. You know he's got it. He doesn't say, wow, you really did rise. Woo. I was impressed with Lazarus, but this, wow. No, that's not what it's about. It's not chalking up, hey, he's a bigger miracle worker than you are, or somebody else is. Or Christian does more miracles than something else, and therefore it's more convincing. No, no. You're my Lord and my God. That's the response that you've really understood. Not that, okay, now all my questions are answered. It's because he's my Lord, because he's my God, you go on discovering answers. But you won't know them all in advance. And Jesus told him, verse 20, I am blessed because you have seen me and you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Only the first generation had the privilege of seeing, but you and I have the privilege of believing without seeing physically, but there's so much else to show us, but supremely because the Spirit of God convicts us and shows us. Christ is sufficient for us. For our sin, so his death, and then by his resurrection, sufficient to impart his strength to us to live the lives he's called us to live. And now he's alive to impart life. And when you say, my Lord and my God, I don't understand everything. I don't have every question answered. My Lord and my God. You will begin to experience spiritual life and reality. And God will use you as God subsequently used the great apostle Thomas. But Jesus did say, stop doubting and believe. 
Our spiritual, moral, and ethical concerns are just as significant to us today as they were to people decades before. Put simply, the same sound biblical lessons are applicable across generations. God's word is for now and forever. This concludes our summer series, and on behalf of the Living Truth team, we hope you enjoy a restful, refreshing summer. Stay connected to Christ's eternal word and join us next time for more clear biblical teaching here on Living Truth. Our program is recorded at the People's Church in Toronto, Canada. If you live in the GTA or plan on visiting, please join us. Everyone's welcome and we'd love to meet you. To watch this message again, visit our website, download transcripts, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional, or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcasts. You can also join us on Facebook and YouTube. Join us next week for a new guest series titled Tough Talks and a message entitled, Has Science Buried God? This is Living Truth. Twentieth and twenty-first century science actually points to a supernatural account of the universe, not away from it. We affirm a God who loves us, and yet who seemingly delays coming to our aid when we feel we need the most help. So whether or not you like the idea of life beyond death, you and I need to wrestle with that. And you